you invest in those copies. <laughs> Up next, a look at the Clans of Caledonia, an economic board game set in the 19th century Scotland. Uh, Clans of Caledonia was designed by Juma Ajuju, features art from Clemens Franz. It was kickstarted in 2017, funded in under three hours, published in North America by Karma Games. Since being published, it has been nominated for seven awards, including the Golden Geek, that's a Board Game Geek Awards, Best Strategy Game and Game of the Year. Though it did fail to win any of them, but still, that many nominations, you know you got a gem here. Now, instead of going through what you get in the box bit by bit, I would like to direct everyone to check out our Clans of Caledonia unboxing video on YouTube to see everything you get in this heavy box. Yeah, heavy for sure. This is one of the most densely packed board game boxes I have ever opened or picked up. Uh, there are a ton of wooden components and a ridiculously thick stack of cardboard punch outs included with this game. Uh, like this is more than an inch. Like, it is a crazy amount. Uh, all I'm going to say here is you get a lot for what you're paying for this game and everything is top notch quality. And that's even in the retail version because man, the Kickstarter even had mono coins and even more shiny bits. Even the retailer is, is really impressed by what you get. Well, can you give us a quick overview of what players are doing in Clans of Caledonia? I mean, it's Scotland, so there must be sheep, right? Uh, there are sheep. Uh, they are a production building, technically, in this game, and they produce wool. Uh, now, I'm not sure how quick I can get through this one, because this is a heavier game. It's up there. It's not heavy, but it's a, it's a heavier game with a lot going on, with a lot of options. But I'll see what I can do to keep it fairly short. Now, we're going to actually talk about theme, because I was writing this up earlier today and went, you know what, I should probably mention the theme, because I'm terrible at that. So in Clans of Caledonia, you're going to take on the role of one of the managed Scottish clans in the 19th century. Uh, this is basically the Industrial Revolution period of Scotland, and you are working to improve Scotland through expansion, trade, and export. Again, it's a rather heavy economic game uh, based around getting production buildings out on the map to produce resources, refining some of those resources, buying and selling both refined and unrefined resources, and fulfilling export contracts. When you fulfill export contracts, you're going to get some points and bonuses, but you're also going to import goods into Scotland. At the same time, players are also trying to spread out on the map and establish a large number of settlements. So, sheep, wool, land, food, maybe some nice scotch too? Oh, of course. There's whiskey as well. It wouldn't be a true game about Scotland without whiskey. This is one of the refined goods that you can turn your grain into whiskey barrels. Now, all this is done through players taking a number of actions each round until everyone passes. Just keeps going around until everyone passes. It usually happens when players are out of money. Now, the actions you can take, there are eight of them, so this will take a little bit to go through, but I'm going to simplify them, is trade. You're going to use your merchants to buy or sell goods on the market. After each transaction, the value is going to be adjusted based on how many goods were bought or sold. So there's an economic engine. It's not just this cost of this, period. Yes. Yeah, very clear. Like, actually, a really nice engine. It's one of the better economic systems I've seen in a game. Um, you can... Obtain one of those export contracts. You're going to take one from a, a central board, pay its cost. What's important is each player can only have one of these. I assume they're powerful enough that holding multiple would be a game breaker. It's not really powerful. It just, it would totally change the game. Like it would just be a very different game if I could just collect all the markets because being stuck with just one and you're stuck with it, you can't discard it. All you can do is fulfill it or not. And if you don't, it's stuck there year after year after year until you fulfill it. So that is a big part of the game and choosing which tile is one of the biggest decisions you have to make. Also, at the start of the game, the first one you buy is probably going to drive your entire direction for the rest of the game. It's going to show you what engine you're going to try to build for. Now, what's interesting is having room for two is actually one of the special abilities of one of the clans. More about that later. Now, the next action is expand. Take one of your production buildings or one of your workers from your player board, place it out on the map, pay any costs. Now, when placing one, you could get what's called the neighborhood bonus. And what this is, is if you place next to another person's player's production building, you can then buy those goods at a discounted price. What's interesting here, though, is you're not buying it off the other player. They get no reward out of this. You're just buying it off that market at a discounted price. I could make sheep jokes here, but I won't. No, there is no wood to trade, at least, so you can't make the Catan joke. Uh, upgrade shipping. Uh, you start on a shipping track normally. You can only place your buildings next to each other, and there are a bunch of rivers on the board. Once you upgrade your shipping once, allows you to go over those rivers. Once you upgrade it more, you can actually go over locks. So similar in some ways to the shipping in Terra Mystica. 
Uh, similar, but not identical. Uh, the one thing that's different here is you can't ship up or down a river like you can in Terra Mystica. All river shipping lets you do is jump over that river. So it basically gets rid of a barrier or a fence. Now, having three shipping means you can't build three hexes away down a river, but it does mean you could build, say, four hexes away if you're crossing four locks. Now, the next action is upgrade technology. This is a way to improve your tools and to make sure workers generate more income every turn. As straightforward as any technology in any game will ever get. Yeah, pretty much. There's two different ones you can improve. Uh, you can hire a merchant. You start with two of them. They allow you to do two transactions in that economic market. where You can buy more up to a maximum of seven throughout the game. Uh, back to those export contracts, you can fulfill one. If you have the goods depicted on the contract, you get the rewards. And you can then take another contract? Yep, by using that export contract action we mentioned earlier. of have gone paying the cost to take it. Uh, and then finally, pass. Pass is an action. This ends your turn, but it also sets the turn order for next turn on who passes first. Plus, you get an amount of money with the players who pass first getting more money than the players who pass later. So you can play longer and achieve more or end sooner and gain more cash. Correct. And go earlier in the next round, which can be really important if you really want to get that hot export contract. Now, once you've all passed, so everyone's gone around the table, everyone's taken the pass action, you're going to go into a production phase. Uh, this is where you're going to get stuff based on what's in play, what's on the board. And the WIS is done by looking at your player board that just tells you your totals. Uh, you're also going to get to refine your goods. So some of the goods you produce can be turned into other goods that are worth more on the market. So, for example, a field produces two grain. Well, a bakery can turn one of those grain into bread. And a distillery can convert one of those grain into a whiskey, but you could also just sell the grain. So there's a, there's definitely some thinking, and it's going to depend on what export contracts you have, which of those goods you need. Cheap food and scotch, a great Scottish tradition. <laughs> now the final phase is scoring. Every round you're going to get glory. Glory is the victory points in this game based on whatever the token is up. So at the beginning of the game, you're going to randomize and put out five tokens, and they're all going to score different things, and it's completely random every time. After the last round, there's an end game scoring. Here you're going to get points for all the glory you've gotten so far in the game, which just makes sense. So that, that'll be very similar to people who played Terraforming Mars. You're going to start off at whatever your Terraforming rating is. Uh, then you're going to take all your leftover goods and you get to sell them. You get points for how much money you have. Uh, the number of imported goods you have. So there are three different types of imported goods. And what you get, this part's neat, is based on how many have been imported overall. So there's three import goods. There's, I'm going to forget because I didn't write them down here, tobacco, sugar cane, and something else. I forget what the last one is. I apologize. Um, depending on how many imp are imported, they're worth different amounts. So the one that's been imported the least is worth the most points. So there's a whole rarity system in play there that I thought was really neat. And then you're going to get a point for the number of settlements you own on the board. So interesting that the, the economic engine uh, continues into that scoring phase mm -hmm. as well, adding rarity uh, into, the, into the value there as well. So again, it's five rounds of scoring plus an additional scoring round, or is the fifth round, the final round, the, the, the fifth scoring round? No, so you, you play five full rounds. Each round ends with a scoring phase. So you finish that fifth round, you finish the fifth scoring phase, then you do an additional end game okay. scoring. Six Where scoring you're rounds, scoring completely different things. You're no right. longer scoring the little token. You're scoring, scoring up the, the list I just went through. Now, all these rules can be modified by the player's clan. This is one of those highly asymmetric games. Every clan is completely different from each other. Uh, some examples. Clan Buchanan has a second export box. That's one I mentioned earlier. Clan Campbell gets a discount on all buildings that process goods, but not just the generic goods, just the processing ones. Clam Cunningham is known for their milk, or sorry, butter, for their butter. And what they can do is they can sell their milk throughout the game for more than it normally costs because it represents converting that milk into butter, which I thought was really neat. Uh, Clam Ferguson starts with more meeples on the board. Clam McDonald has like a weird rule where they can place workers out on locks and they represent fishermen. And during the game, they can move the fishermen around in the locks. Like it really different abilities for each of the, the, the different clans. So very much like Terra Mystica in that the, the clan you choose, much like your race in uh, Terra Mystica, yeah massively influences how you're going to play the game. Correct. Yeah, it's definitely different. Uh, they, they each play different, and they're going to give you a direction almost right from the beginning of the game. If you're going to get extra money every time you sell goods, you're going to spend most of the game trying to sell goods. If you're Clan Buchanan and you want to make milk, you're probably going to try to get lots of cows out there to get lots of milk so you can convert it to butter. Um, I got to say, 
one of the signs, uh, no, I didn't give a disclaimer at the start of this review. That's because I bought this game. This is a good indication of how much I expected to like this game. This isn't a review copy. This is something I went down to Hugen & Munin, our local gaming store, and picked up and spent my good money on. And I am happy to report I don't regret this purchase in any way whatsoever. I greatly enjoy this game. Now, longtime fans know how much I like asymmetric games. So right there, there's a win, right? Clans of Caledonia is up there for having some of the most asymmetric powers, player powers out there. And there's lots of them. There's eight or nine clans in the game. I forget. And you're only playing four players. So it goes both places. Um, I, I love how everything looks. Like the, the, the meeple are all unique, which I thought was really nice. It was a nice touch. Every, every resource looks different. Every they, they have a different texture, a different width they're all different colors having unique wooden pieces for all the different buildings is a huge bonus i would have liked the metal coins from the kickstarter but hey i didn't kickstart it i'd be tempted but other than that i'm really happy with this because you know what if this would have been a mayfair game or a rio grande game especially from a couple years ago i would have just had a bunch of different colored cubes and maybe cardboard shits it's really nice to have the uniquely shaped meeples which is also something that helps the game be more accessible with people with vision problems, which thankfully I don't have, but is a selling point and it's great to see. For the record, this game was purchased at the CG Realm. Hugen and Munin went out of business a number of years ago. Yeah, it's today's the time travel episode <laughs> where May comes before June. Come on, Hugen and Munin can still be there. Yes, I apologize. The CG Realm here in Windsor, Ontario. And great story. Always... At least the, one of the owners is the same. There's... And May always does come before June, but not before <laughs> April. There you go. I don't, I don't even know. It, it's quarantine <laughs> time. I can't even say it. Quarantine. All right. Um, so some p potential negatives. Uh, the learning curve steep. Uh, uh, you got eight different actions, right? So any game where I have to explain to you eight different things you can do on your turn and why you might want to do them makes it hard to learn. But um, they're easy to understand. Each of those eight actions is not difficult the weight of the game comes with the interactions of those actions and how your actions are going to affect the other players and how their actions are going to affect you. Now there's no direct conflict. There's no stealing people's resources. There's no removing another player's thing from the map. There's the Scottish clans can't go to war in this game, uh, but there is a ton of indirect conflict. Map positioning can be huge. Who gets a spot first, especially with those rules at the end of the game for how many different colonies you have. The timing on buying and selling on goods is huge because the market fluctuates. So if you can get in and sell before someone buys, you're going to get more money and so on, right? That, that is another big one. And one of the things that's huge in this game, as I kind of hinted at earlier, are those export tiles. Being able to get the tiles you want and you can fulfill or possibly deny someone else from getting one. If you can get a contract and you've already got the goods in front of you, you're laughing, right? You want people to be able to have to pick up um, export tiles they have to work for. Or if you've got the goods in front of you, you want to make sure you go first to get that one tile you can already fulfill. And uh, as for conflict, the Scotch were far more worried about those Southern English uh, <laughs> problem people. So uh, they weren't too busy fighting with themselves. Well, I'm sure there were enough Scots fighting against themselves, but especially with all that whiskey going on, but I'm sure those were more personal fights. Uh, overall, Clans of Caledonia is a meaty economic game with a ton of indirect player interaction, um, where long-term strategy and planning can really pay off, uh, where you have to be willing to adapt and change your plans, though, when based on what the other players are doing. It can be unforgiving of mistakes, but to me, that's a feature of the game and not a flaw. Uh, you can make mistakes and you can be out of it. Uh, it's going to be difficult to recover if you make a big enough mistake. But that, to me, is what these heavier strategy games are all about. If you like heavier strategy, Euro games, economic games, I strongly suggest checking this game out. All right. Well, now it's already come in the chat room and, <laughs> and I've pointed it out. Many people out there like to compare this game to Gaia Project and Terra Mystica. What are your uh, thoughts on that? I, I get it and I don't. Like, I can see it, but I, I just don't see why they need to be lumped in the same group. They're not similar enough. Like, there are some similarities, but, like, every board game has similarities to another game. It's like saying that, that Clank and Dominion are, are the same game. They're too similar. I'm like, yeah, they're both deck builders, so of course they have some similarities. Like, yeah, you're doing the whole take things off your player board, and then that tells you your income. Okay, I get it, but you know what? Eclipse does that. Tapestry does that. Like, it's not just these three games that have that player board. So to me, I mean, it's it's got the player board. It's got the hex map of yeah. playing. There is interaction in that 
if you build something next to someone, you are getting a lower price when you build, when you do something, you know, there, there are a number of similarities. Now I totally see where the economic engine in this blows away a lot of things that Terra yeah. Mystica has going on. Like that's fantastic. But uh, if you look at the contract, if you look at the, the, the way the rel, you know, you randomize what the, uh, uh, what the scoring is for each round, the same way you do in Terra Mystica. Mm. Um, again, there's, there are a significant number of similarities that I think encourage people to drop these together, even if when you get down to the nitty gritty and you actually sit down and play it, the, the economic aspects of it differentiate it massively well, yeah. away from Terra Mystica. Uh, well, gee, but again, besides, on the surface, besides, it, it really looks like it. Uh, besides just the market, there's also the fulfilling of goods. The whole thing in this is fulfilling contracts. There's none of that in Gaia Project or Terra Mystica. You're not trying to produce resources to fulfill an order. Like that's a totally different type of game. Like no, yes, but, but you but the, but there are things in uh, in in Terra Mystica where you know if you you've got your uh, your the tokens when you when you pass your turn you pick up your token and no you're not trying to fulfill that but you are getting bonuses based on what you do. On that tag. So if, you know, if I pick up the one that's going to give me bonuses every time I build a, you know, uh, a trading house, I'm going to be building trading houses that, yeah. that turn based on that token I have picked up. So again, a See, to me, that's like a generic different. Euro game again, thing. Simil it's because of the number of similarities, even though, again, the games are very different. Yeah, I don't know. Like, like yes, you're placing stuff on a hex map. Yeah, there's a thing where if I place next to you, something happens. Okay, that's in both games. <laughs> Though what happens is completely different. I got it. Yeah, okay. And, and yes, there's the asymmetric player powers. Now that one, that yes, the, the, the clans do feel kind of like the various different factions of the other game. But again, that's something that's in other games, right? Like Zolkin has that. You're going to draft. Actually, Zolkin, Zolkin with Tribes and Prophecies is really close to this because one of the things you do in this that I skipped over, it's in my full review, is you lay out a number of clans equal to the players plus one, and then there's starting resource tokens that are placed next to them. So you're going to pick a clan and a starting resource token to see what you get at the start, instead of like Terra Mystica where you just click the board. Where Zolkin is identical. You literally are going to pick between your various tribes, and there's going to be a starting resource token, and you pick both. And I'm like, to me, the, then why aren't those two games thrown in the same boat? I just, I don't know. It, it, it gets me. The, the, the people like to throw them together. Like, I, I, I think... They have some things in common. It's it's true, but most board games have things in common with each other. Like they're inspired by each other. These aren't the same designers. They're not the same publishers. Like like people seem to talk about this game as like the third in the series, and I just I don't see it as a series. Yes, it, it has some stuff together. I I don't know what whatever. I personally I own both. I own Terra Mystica. I own Clans of Caledonia. I played Gaia Project. It, I have a blog post if you want me to compare Terra Mystica Gaia Project. That's not what this is about. I I think having both is perfectly valid. One doesn't replace or outdo the other. I find my thought process in Clans of Caledonia very different. I'm in a very different brain space when playing this game. This is I'm thinking more economics instead of um, engine optimization. I'm not worrying about points as much as I'm worrying about having the money to complete the actions I want to complete. It's just, I don't know, it's a different brain space. I fe They feel like very different games. I personally will get the desire to play one or the other, right? So... I want to play Terra Mystica. I want to play Clans of Taldonia are two different things. If I say, hey, I want to play Terra Mystica, and someone's like, hey, no, let's play Clans of Taldonia instead, I'd be like, why? Like, I guess if you want, I'll probably do that because I'm a nice guy. But like to me, it's not like, well, we'll play this instead because it's a similar type of game. I, I just don't think liking one means you have to necessarily like the other, and I don't think not liking one of them is going to mean you're not going to like it. So if you hate Terra Mystica, you may love Clans of Caledonia. If you like Terra Mystica, you'll probably like Clans of Caledonia. I don't think if you like Terra Mystica, you probably will like Clans of Caledonia is necessarily valid either. I, each each game, each of the three, Gaia Project as well, stands on its own to me. To, my my thought on this one is, and again, I have not yet played Clans of Caledonia. I haven't been down since. Uh, but to me, if you like the asymmetrical uh, sort of map-based game style, and you love economic engines, then yeah. I would absolutely recommend Cans of Caledonia. Where, so if, if the economic engine and the similarities to Terra Mystica are two Fair. things that are likable. Uh, and yeah. it's, a, it's a nice way, not necessarily to compare them, but to give you a reference with which to talk about Clans of Caledonia. Uh, imagine Terra Mystica with a kick-ass uh, economic engine, 
that you know blows away anything that that do, uh, like that doesn't exist in Terra Mystica at all. Yeah, but then the opposite, like you don't have the god tracks in this. If part of what you like in Terra Mystica is the elemental tracks and going up that and the whole power system, none of that's here, yeah, right? See, and I've I've never really got. I, I part of the reason I don't do too well is because I'm not very <laughs> good at using the priests in uh, Terra Mystica. Whereas again, I want to throw Zolkin in the mix because Zolkin has god tracks that are really similar to Terra Mystica's elemental tracks. Like I, it just, it, it's the fact, I know what it is. It's I get frustrated when people go, oh, what's a better game, Terra Mystica or Gaia Project? And someone has to jump in and go, Clans of Caledonia. And I'm like, no, like that's a yeah, different see, that's, game. That's ridiculous. Like that, that's where it bugs me. Like people tend to lump these games in as like the, the Star Wars trilogy, all three go together. And I'm like, no, this is like like the, the Ewok movie versus, <laughs> which I like because I grew up, I was a kid when those right. came out. I was a kid when Jedi came out. So you, you can tell a person's age by whether they love or hate Return of the Jedi. I am in the love fairy because wicked's awesome like it's just it's a different yeah it's it, it's a board game it's area control it's it's asymmetric it's got a bunch of features that i like in games and those features happen to be in both games which is why i own both games and why i like both games all right well for a more <laughs> in-depth look at clans of caledonia you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews